Gospel of Mark. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones <clears throat> who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone was hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter maimed than with two hands and go to hell, where the fire never goes out. And if a foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Service and prayer are two of the greatest gifts that we have to give to one another and to the world. Our reading today points to um, power and privilege that we have as humans in partnership with God to make this world a better place. Whether we're casting out demons, whether we are sharing a cup of water, whether we are sharing in the gifts of healing and service in Christ's name. We are gifts of blessing to God and to the world. You and I are called to be blessings. Has anybody ever called you that before? You are a blessing. You are a blessing. A friend of mine tells of time uh, while in seventh or eighth grade, or maybe both, his family lived in England. He was, they were on one of the military bases. And he attended um, an English boys' school. Talked about it, wore a uniform. I'm like, so did I. Went to, you know, Catholic school, wore a uniform. And um, <clears throat> he even had to go to school half a day on Saturday. And uh, rode the train to school to and from every day, played field hockey, and hung out with the boys after school. Well, one afternoon, while walking back to the train station, he had his book bag on his back and his hockey gear was strapped down and as he was walking he said I fell completely to the ground I looked up 
and I saw my two stumbling blocks. There were two older boys laughing as they unhooked their hockey sticks from my legs. He went on to say, I still remember from days of practicing law, the names and the faces of a couple of lawyers uh, who always seemed to be stumbling blocks to cooperation and to justice and to truth-telling. At least, he says, that's how I saw them. And so I suspect if we put in a hot minute here, we can think about and name and see easily maybe people who have tried to trip us up or circumstances that have interfered with our life or kept us from getting what we wanted. Stumbling blocks, yes? Well, my guess is that every one of us, every one of us here could tell a story or two about the stumbling blocks in your life. The who, the what, the where, the when, the why. How you overcame it, how you're still struggling with it. What you did to get even, maybe. Stumbling blocks. Have you met a stumbling block this past week? <laughs> what happened? How did it overcome? Are you still working through it? Are your knees a little scraped up from tripping over those stumbling blocks? Well, in our gospel lesson today, there's a story about John and some of the other disciples running into a few stumbling blocks, um, people that were considered by them to be outsiders, meaning they were not one of the disciples. Um, and they were doing things that the disciples were supposed to be doing, that Jesus did, the healing, the, you know, um, the cleansing, all of that. And they came to Jesus and they, you know, kind of like little kids do. They're not one of us. But Jesus doesn't deter them. He's like, look, if they're you know, working in our name, they're not working against us. And sometimes we have to stop and think about that. Maybe people aren't doing activities or events or um, being in ministry the way we think it should be done better taking up new ways. And rather than complaining about those folks that are serving in ministry and doing some good in the world in a way that's different than the way we would think about doing it or the way we used to do it, deadly words in the church, what are they? Anybody? I know you know them. We've never done it that way before. Right? <clears throat> I get excited when I hear those words. Great! We've never done it that way before. Let's try something new. And so Jesus is saying, you know, don't, they're, they're working with us. And maybe we need to take our lesson from that and work together with those that are doing ministry in a new and different way. Something different, something that's going to uh, uh, draw the attention of, of people in this world today. And so, Jesus did what he normally does, and he likes to do examples of things. 
And so he picked up a child and put the child there. Um, and this is sort of a continuation of the scripture that sermon that you would have had last week had I been here. Um, but he put the child in the middle of him and welcomed him and, and said that we are to be um, like children who are vulnerable, who are powerless, and we are to care for them and care for one another. But John wants to take that conversation a little further about this guy who's a stumbling block. Well, Lord, he cast out demons in your name. Okay, Jesus would think. But he kept going. You see, Jesus takes a different approach. He erases the line and he enlarges the circles. He isn't so concerned about another person who causes us to stumble. His concern is focused on us, not the other person. And it's kind of a twofold approach. First, whether we want to have want to become a stumbling block to somebody else, because let's face it, sometimes we do that. We become stumbling blocks to other people. Maybe it's the little child that's sitting in the circle. Maybe it's those uh, new folks coming to church that want to try something different and we shut them down. The second way is that we become stumbling blocks to ourselves. We take up and do things maybe that we know that is not necessarily good for us. And we become, as the saying goes, our own worst enemy. And Jesus is again saying to us, don't worry about that other guy. Don't focus on those things but rather be in ministry and take care of the people that are around you that need to hear the word of Christ. Don't fall into the challenges that come when we um, try to uh, use salt substitutes in our life. Be the salt to the world. Jesus is telling us not to be salt substitutes, not to focus on the bitterness, the anger, the gossip, the, the, the sin of the world, and allow those things to taint how we do our lives and how we do our ministry and how we reach out to be different in this world. You and I are called to be salt, not salt substitutes. Now, they may have a place in our life in terms of health and so forth, but in our faith, there is no room for substitutes. You and I need to be the salt that is out in the world. That means we're out in the world and we are sharing the love of Christ that we have experienced for ourselves with the world. <clears throat> One of the um, events that happened in the course of this week that was a surprise and also a gift and a blessing. Um, while I was in the hospital, when I went to the hospital, they took me to a local hospital. Um, and I'll name it because I'm, I was, it may not be your experience, but it's been mine. It took me to Oberlin. And, um, you know, I'm used to going to the mega big hospitals with, you know, 75 floors on them or something, you know, the big hospitals. And so I was a little, uh, 
worried about going to the smaller hospital. Um, but I have to say I was pleasantly surprised because what I discovered is in the course of um, my stay there is that every person, every person from the people that sit in the offices and do the administrative kind of stuff to the people who are in the trenches day in and day out, the nurses, the therapists, the x-ray technicians, the people who take your blood, the um, uh, people who deliver your, your meal tray, the people who fix your food, the people who come and empty the trash. And I'm sure there's some more that are behind the scenes that I didn't see, but the ones that I saw that I encountered, there were a couple of things that I um, made note of. Number one, how friendly everybody was. When they came in your room or saw you in the hall, hi. And if they had an encounter with you previously and they could remember your name, they used your name. And so it was high worth. And as I was doing physical therapy up and down the hall, and people would see me, they would say, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. And there were times when um, maybe the, the person who picks up the, the meal trays was a little behind because she had stopped to talk to somebody in their room. And a nurse or a therapist or the person who mops the floor had come in and my tray was still sitting there. And are you finished with this? Let me take it out and put it on the tray. And they would take I heard the um, doctor who was in charge of a lot of us, um, the person in the room next to me was uh, cold. And he said, well, let me get you a blanket. And out he goes and comes back with a blanket. The doctor. And so there was this culture there of friendly, a culture of cooperation, a culture of helpfulness, a culture of caring and compassion. Not just for patients, but for one another. You know, because people talk and out in the hallway while they're doing charting, hey, how's it going with your son? Or is your mom doing better? How is your vacation? This ongoing culture, and honestly, I never met a person there who worked there or even visited for that matter that was mean and grumpy. In other facilities such as that, I have met those people. And well, it's not my job to take your tray out, you know, um, kind of thing. And so there's this beautiful culture that's there. As I was watching it and being a part of it this week, I thought, this is what we are called to be and do in the church. Because it caught my attention. And I know if it catches my attention, um, it's going to catch the attention of other people in the world. We are all supposed to be caring and compassionate. That's what it means to be salt. What I experienced at the hospital is what Jesus is talking about, about being salt to the earth. And so my challenge for all of us this morning is how are we being salt? to the earth? How are we being salty, and not in a negative way, with each other? How are we loving and caring 
and being the people of God to each other. Because if we're not doing it with each other, we can't do that really well with the rest of the world. So I, um, I put that out there for us. Now, I know a couple of my nurses and doctors may be listening to this when it comes on. I promise I will keep up with the unsaltedness in the areas where I need to, okay? Um, but, you know, for us in our faith, we are not to use the substitutes, but we're to be the real thing. So let us go to be the salt of the earth. Amen. <laughs>